Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for connecting to this uh, webinar because uh, I know that you guys are very busy. You have busy schedules, but you find time to participate in this uh, webinar. Therefore, I really appreciate your presence here for one hour and a half that we'll be spending together. Uh, my name is Taro Boel. I'm uh, the moderator of this webinar. I'm an economist working for the commodity branch at Antap. Um, and we also uh, appreciate the collaboration with you and ECE uh, through my colleague, uh, uh, Ari, who has invited also Dario. So um, this webinar is um, about um, a report that was launched in October, 2023. Uh, it's called the uh, Commodity and, and Development Report. Um, the issues in the in the report uh, uh, include uh, economic diversification, inequality, climate change, and green energy policies. Uh, my colleague Danielle will share with you um, the link to the report in, in the chat uh, in the in the Q and A um, box. And also, if you have questions, please. Uh, I drop them in the in the Q and A uh, Q and A box. So this webinar will be in three main parts. The first one is the opening remark from UNEC and uh, Anta, and then we have the presentation by Clovis, and then also we have the panel discussion followed by question and uh, and answers. So first of all, I would like to uh, introduce. Uh, people who are going to uh, make the opening uh, remark. Uh, I'll start with uh, Clovis. Uh, Clovis is the newly appointed chief of uh, commodity research and analysis section at the uh, commodity branch. And this is within the division of international trade and commodities at ANTA in Geneva. He's an economist specialized in economic uh, diversification and strategies for building productive capacities in developing countries. His work uh, support the structure, transformation and sustainable development of commodity dependent developing countries. He has uh, over 20 years of work experience in the United Nations in programs related to commodity dependence, uh, least developing countries, technology and innovation for development, disaster risk reduction. He holds a degree in uh, computer engineering from the technology Institute of Aeronautics in Brazil, a master's degree also in computer science from the University of Brasilia, an MBA uh, in uh, strategic management of information systems for uh, uh, from the University of Brazil as well, and a PhD in maturation in the Netherlands. So, uh, Clovis, you have the floor, but maybe um, just to mention that in the program, we should have um, uh, Mio, who is the director at the interim of our our uh, our division, but she's not here. So uh, Clovis would uh, uh, deliver the opening remark on our behalf. Well, thank Clovis you very much. There. Thank you very much, Taro, and thank you for this introduction. Yeah, colleagues, uh, welcome to this webinar. I, I, in, a, in, in fact, I will be making opening remarks on behalf of uh, Ms. Uh, Miho Shirotori, the acting director of the Division International Trade and Commodities of Anktad. And so I, I will quote, it's, a, it's with great pleasure that I stand a warm welcome to each one of you to this webinar. Our focus today will be on, on inclusive economic diversification and energy transition. First and foremost, I express my sincere gratitude to our colleague, Daru Liguti, Director of the Sustainable Energy Div the, uh, Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNC, and his dedicated team. They have made uh, exceptional contributions to this event. We were very thank to, thankful to them. So today we gather to discuss the key insights of the UNCTAD's Commodity and Development Report 2023 and particularly as they pertain to UNC uh, member countries. Uh, the report, it underscores the continued dependence of few countries in the UNC regions on commodity exports. And in the 
countries that depend on exports of primary goods such oil, natural gas, or gold uh, remain vulnerable to external shocks. These shocks may include commodity price volatility, exchange rate fluctuations, the supply network disruptions, geopolitical conflicts, as well as being worsening the impact of such of these uh, shocks. So in light of these challenges, I would like to highlight two key points from the report that are essential for crafting successful economic diversification strategies. The first point is the need for countries to diversify through strategies of inclusiveness that avoid the pitfalls of inequality. So in the report, it identifies that while export diversification is associated with rising income and reduction of inequality between countries, it is also positively associated with income inequality within countries. Surprisingly, it reveals this positive correlation between human capital also and income inequality. And as countries diversify their exports, part of their population achieves upward mobility, but others remain in existing labor conditions. So the report underscores the need for governments to implement inclusive social policies while promoting diversification. The second important element that I would like to highlight is that any successful diversification strategy must consider climate emergency. So the report shows that economic diversification has so far depended on the extensive use of fossil fuels. And with climate change, we can no longer pursue this kind of path. So therefore, countries dependent on, um, on commodities, they have to an extra burden of diversifying through new and less carbon intensive path. So what exactly does this new burden mean? So in the report, we mentioned that governments in commodity dependent developing countries will have to implement green industrial policies to diversify. They will have to dig deep into the untapped uh, potential of renewable energy source. They'll have to explore new energy markets and green products that may lead to new jobs, boost incomes and reduce inequalities. All of, all of this will have to take place while reducing CO2 emissions. So this presents a formidable challenge. And um, as you know, um, the, the role of the government is essential in this process. So dear participants, allow me to also highlight some aspects of the report that hold particular significance for the UNC region. And what we would like to highlight in particular is, is a critical energy transition minerals, which are key for sustainable energy future. So these minerals that include copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt, among others, they are essential for manufacturing uh, clean technologies, wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, batteries, and so on. The demand of these minerals uh, uh, for these minerals will grow significantly as the world moves towards clean uh, energy source. But at the same time, the concentration of their production and processing in few countries may pose some challenges, including in the UNC region. For example, Poland and Hungary, uh, which are significant players in Europe's electric vehicle uh, battery production sector, they will require reliable access to critical energy transition minerals. So ensuring access to these minerals and related products depend on diversification of parts of their value chain. And mineral endowed countries in the UNC region, like um, such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, they have the opportunity to add value locally instead of exporting raw, mat raw minerals. This would increase the resilience of green product uh, supply chains while also benefiting the produ pro producers and consumers of these uh, products. So ultimately, increased resilience will also contribute to mitigating climate change. So in conclusion, it is evident that many commodity dependent developing countries lack the necessary support for green industrial policies and inclusive diversification. They need access to financial assistance, technology investment, and, and only through this assistance can they uh, transition towards a diversified, inclusive, resilient, low carbon future. And I'm confident that this webinar will enrich the discussion on commodities and development among UNC member states. And, we all, and uh, without any further ado, I now would like to, to pass the floor to our colleague, Dario, 
who will further in, enrich this dialogue. And end quote here. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, Clovis, and uh, thank you for the very comprehensive, uh, uh, I would say, introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for joining this uh, joint UNTA UNIC webinar on inclusive economic diversification and energy transition. I would like, first of all, to thank obviously UNTA for the collaboration for producing this timely and insightful report on the challenges and opportunities faced by commodity-dependent developing countries and global clean energy transitions. As you may know, UNIC is one of the five regional commissions of the UN Secretariat, and we cover 56 countries spanning from North America, the whole of Europe, the ex-Soviet uh, ex Union, Central Asia, Turkey, and Israel. Uh, and so we, in, with that, we embark, as Clovis already mentioned, some commodities producing countries, but as well some major areas of commodities use, the European Union, the US, for example. Uh, our aim is to promote economic integration, cooperation, and sustainable development across our region and beyond. And one of the key areas of work of our commission is obviously in the sustainable energy, which is the division that I, I, I have the honor to lead, which encompasses the whole energy value chain Going, coming from sustainable resource management, which is the subject of today's webinar, but all the way through energy, energy production uh, and energy consumption, whether it's under the form of energy efficiency, renewable energy, energy connectivity, et cetera. Coming back to what, what is the subject matter of today's webinar, uh, we very well know very well the importance of critical raw materials and resources for the energy transition as highlighted by the UNCTAD report, highlighted by many other players uh, around, around the world. These critical minerals include are such as lithium, nickel, cobalt, rare elements are essential for producing the low carbon technologies needed for the energy transition, such as solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electrical vehicles, etc. So the demand for these uh, critical materials has already increased but is expected to increase enormously, exponentially going forward in the coming years. As countries strive to achieve their climate and energy goals under the Paris Agreement on one side and the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. As I said, UNIC region is a key player in the global supply chain of critical raw materials, whether producer, whether the you know, refiner at the first stage or actually uh, end user of these critical materials in the technologies that I mentioned before. And it and encompasses you know, some of the major producers, Canada, Sweden, Finland, Central Asia, sub-region already mentioned by Clovis in his introductory words, but Turkey as well, et cetera. The largest importing areas, European Union imports most of its uh, needs in critical raw minerals from outside but as well North America and Canada as, 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 as very important uh, uh, exporters. However, this transition has it, it forces us to recognize as well the potential risks and challenges associated with the supply and use of these materials, such as environmental and social impacts, geopolitical tensions, price volatility, and market concentration. Mining is an, uh, an activity which has an impact on the environment. The, the, the name of the game here is how to mitigate as much as possible that impact. Certainly in this energy transition, we don't want to do the same errors that we did in last energy transition when we left biomass, we embraced fossil fuels and we're now paying the price of that choice uh, without having thought about the uh, unwanted uh, um, consequences of that choice. Certainly today we benefit from that experience and we should be not be repeating the errors that we did in the past. However, this approach therefore should aim to ensure availability, affordability and sustainability of the critical materials. These three elements go into what we call a resilient energy system, into what it makes the energy transition happen, but it's equally applicable to critical materials. So availability, of course, because the energy transition is a global affair. Affordability, because the global the energy transition will happen if it's a just transition, if it's, there is social acceptance, 
to that transition and sustainability because we don't want future generations to pay the price of our choices today. To support this approach, we at UNEC have developed two interrelated tools, the United Nations Framework Classification for Resources, better known under its acronym UNFC, and the United Nations Resource Management System, UNRMS. These tools provide a common language and a comprehensive framework for classifying and managing all types of resources, including energy, minerals, water, and land. The key principles of these systems are resource efficiency, circularity, and innovative uh, approaches such as resource servitization. Here, the idea is to minimize the impact uh, of, this, uh, of these activities on the environment. And a lot of that mitigation will come from not only recycling, not only reusing, uh, but establishing closed uh, circular loops and resource servitization, which means transforming resources from a commodity to a service. These approaches can help commodity-dependent uh, developing countries diversify their economies as one of the principles that uh, Clovis has mentioned, uh, guiding principles coming out from the UNTAD report, enhance resource governance, a very, very, very important point, especially in emerging markets, in some of these developing markets, attract investments, very necessary to uh, um, allow the energy transition uh, take place and foster, and foster regional cooperation. Let me, let me touch upon a, an initiative that has been launched by the Secretary General that goes under the name of the UN Working Group on Transforming the Extractive Industries for Sustainable Development. We heard that the extractive industries and the energy transition constitute an incredible development opportunity, especially for developing countries, rich in material, rich in energy resources, but that this richness, this wealth has to, ha has to be harnessed in a way which is sustainable. And therefore, the Secretary General, mindful of these issues, launched this UN Working Group to which UNCTAD belongs to as well, UNDP, UNEP, the five regional economic commissions, and other UN agencies and international organizations. We are all putting our strengths, we are all putting our, our tools and our skills together to provide the world, member states, uh, and all stakeholders within this industry with the relevant guidelines and the relevant in a path towards a sustainable industry. The working group therefore aims to facilitate policy dialogue, knowledge sharing, as I just mentioned, technical assistance and capacity building among stakeholders to promote the transformation of the extractive industries that too much in the past was associated with a negative image. So ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a critical moment for the energy transition. We just published last week the SDG report for our region, and we are only on, on 20 objectives of the SDG report. We are on track on 20 objectives out of 170 and plus overall objectives. And so it's not looking good. Uh, therefore, we there really the need to put you know, our words into action. The, we are suffering from a number of, of recent, uh, the consequences, the impact of recent issues such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the geopolitical uh, tensions and the wars taking place in our region. Uh, we are living through what uh, the UNEP calls the triple climate warming, environmental degradation and economic fragility crisis and biodiversity loss. On the brighter side, however, these crises have also created a unique opportunity to build a new world, better and greener. We need to seize this opportunity and work together. This is UNCTAD and UNIC working together is an example of how can we, uh, different UN agencies with different skills can work together for the, for the general good. And I hope that this webinar will provide all of you a valuable platform for exchanging views and experiences on the issues and solutions related to inclusive diversification and energy transition. I look forward to hearing from the speakers and the participants and learning from the UNCTAD report and its recommendations.
Please join us in our efforts to support the commodity developing countries, commodity dependent developing countries, excuse me, and to advance the global agenda for sustainable energy and development. And thank you for attention. And Taro, the word is back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dario. Uh, for those who don't know Dario, Dario is the director of the Sustainable Energy uh, Session at the United uh, Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And that commission covers uh, 56 member states in North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, in this capacity, he provides analysis, policy advice, and assistance to government for the implementation of the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement to facilitate international cooperation in energy within and outside the region. Um, Dario has a master's degree in economics from uh, Bucconi University in Milan and uh, a master of art in European law from Lancaster University in the UK. Thank you, Dario, again, and thank you, Clovis. Now I give back the floor to Clovis, and this time is for his presentation on the report. Um, Clovis, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Taro. Let me just uh, share my screen quickly. Okay. So uh, I hope you can see that. So colleagues, we uh, uh, acted, in ACTAD, we are celebrating its uh, 60th anniversary this year in 2024. And it has been 60 years of work on the analysis of research commodities and development, on trade and development. Um, but uh, the sad reality is that uh, the dependence on export of commodities, it's as widespread in the developing world today as it was 60 years ago. So what this uh, picture tells us is that out of 195 UNCTAD member countries, 95 are commodity dependent developing countries. This corresponds like to two thirds of developing economies that remain commodity dependent. And in our classification, this means relying 60% or more of their exports on primary goods. So this includes 66% of small island developing states, 83% of least developed countries, 85% of landlocked developing countries. And in this region, we have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Norway, the Russian Federation, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, all classified as commodity dependent, mainly on minerals and energy. So for some of these countries, a complicating factor is that their trade dependence is on a single commodity, like crude oil in Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan or natural gas in, in Turkmenistan. The commodity dependence, it makes these countries highly vulnerable to shocks, experiencing volatile incomes, macroeconomic and political instability sometimes, and low levels of development in many commodity dependent countries. This graph shows the association between the UNCTAD commodity price index and the GDP per capita in developing countries, excluding China. It shows this data from 96 to 2021. And what we see is this strong correlation between these two uh, series. So this has a serious impact on development. When price of commodities go up, the economy goes up. When it goes down, goes down. Out of 32 countries that have the lowest human development index score, 29 are commodity dependent countries. So the, the, um, the way to overcome this challenge to get out of commodity dependence is to diversify for these countries to diversify this economy. In this graph, what we illustrate that, it shows that diversification is directly and positively associated with higher total GDP. And it's not only that, diversification insulates against uh, market shocks, against, um, it stimulates economic growth, also drives the structural transformation. So is that is the way out of, of the dependence. But then comes the first message of the report. And this is that diversification is critical is fundamental is essential and brings benefits but also may have drawbacks if not accompanied by inclusiveness policies so 
producing more sophisticated products may widen inequalities if higher skilled workers, they capture most opportunities and command higher wages. So this could widen these within country disparities. In terms of research, um, the, there is limited uh, studies on the links between diversification and inequality. And the results have been mixed in the literature. So some studies suggest that diversification results in higher wages for skilled workers and thus uh, greater inequality. Other studies that diversification bring opportunities for all and decrease inequality. So in this report, we present in the, in, an empirical analysis of 182 countries between 1998 and 2018. So 20 years uh, time period. It shows that while export diversification may increase income is also is associated with greater inequality within country. And we have summarized this result in this figure of, of the screen and where you see uh, the, the coefficients of regression between these different export diversification measures and income inequality. And the call of these circles, they represent how factors affect inequality. The green represent positive association and the red a negative association. And what these figures show is that diversification has been associated with this increasing inequality within countries. So let me now go to the second uh, key message of the report, is that commodity dependent developing countries, they must become more resilient by moving up the value chain and diversifying the economies. We know that, but these countries now have to diversify through low carbon paths in the context of climate change and energy transition. And the problem is that historically economic diversification has relied on extensive use of fossil fuels. And what this figure shows is that both for the countries dependent on commodities and those that are not dependent on commodities, um, they both, these both uh, uh, the groups, they have followed the same path in relation to the relationship between diversification and carbon emissions. From 1995 to 2019, on average, diversification of one new export is being associated with adding 3.1 tons of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So the second key message of the report is that the commodity dependent developing countries need to make growth less carbon intensive without compromising their economic development. So, um, and uh, as you see in this figure, uh, more diversified developed and developing countries they have high emissions compared with the countries um, that are developing countries dependent on commodities. For example, on average, a person in a commodity dependent developing country generates about one third of the emissions of a person in the European Union, one fourth of someone in China and one seventh of a person in the United States. That's when we consider the emissions per capita, but we know that in terms of emission per GDP, the situation is different. Every additional dollar in the GDP of a commodity dependent country has a higher effect on emissions than the additional dollar GDP on a developed uh, economy. But uh, in a way that's because lower levels of diversification there is, uh, there is a lot of capacities to be built, to, to be able to grow, in, in terms, including in terms of infrastructure, factories, logistics, you know, and all of that adds to the emissions. And there are also differences in the way that uh, the association between emissions and growth change over time. In developed countries, these emissions fluctuate with the business, business cycle, where in the developing countries, they gradually rise with the GDP of the country. So, what are the lessons that we can learn from the experience of the countries that are the early industrializers? Well, if we look at France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, for example, only uh, they only were able to totally decouple from their growth, uh, the growth from the emissions in the 1950s, and and well, that was well into their industrialization process. And the United States only decoupled in the 90s. And the Japan is yet to reach the stage in which the economic growth is associated with fewer emissions. So we should expect different pathways depend on country circumstances and with some countries reducing carbon intensity of growth faster than other countries. Uh, and the uh, commodity dependent countries, they must diver diversify their economies while aligning their efforts to achieve this just 
energy transition. So in doing so, they should prioritize inclusivity by creating jobs and ad addressing the income distribution concerns. And one important element for that is green industrial policies. They are essential for this. You know, they should integrate elements from conventional factors uh, uh, driving economic uh, transformation and factors specific to low carbon economy. There are some entry points for these policies, depending on the commodity of countries that are dependent on commodities. For example, countries that depend on the export of, of fossil fuels, one entry point for green industrial policy could be to transfer um, um, income during boom periods into asset portfolios through commodity-based sovereign wealth funds um, that should be well uh, um, uh, transparent, that effectively manage, and so on. For mining countries, there are uh, two considerations to make for important uh, clean technology metals such as cobalt, lithium, Mining should be linked with domestic and, and regional value uh, chains, as we mentioned. And, um, and one example for that is um, this recent uh, um, agreement between Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia, who uh, to jointly manufacturing the precursors of um, electric car batteries. And that is a good example of these, how they can um, uh, collaborate to add value. And uh, while developing these capacities uh, for diversifying these mineral exporting countries should also promote environmental, social and government, governance guidelines, ensure equitable distribution of gains, build the strong institution governing the commodity sector. And we will be discussing more of that uh, in this session. And commodity dependent countries that depend on agriculture, they can process more crops locally while also shortening the supply chain. Uh, although this is not easy, um, countries can try to move to, to um, also smart agriculture, increase efficiency and crop productivity while reducing their uh, carbon emissions. In terms of uh, critical minerals, I would like to highlight and uh, show to you this, this uh, a, a picture of a value chain of uh, lithium trade flows along the electric vehicle value chains. And what we see is that trade values, they increase as we go downstream and to uh, um, go further on the value chain. So enhancing value along the value chain, it increases the export revenues for, for countries. Um, so this contributes to increasing um, GDP, national income, and so on. And this domestic value addition to critical minerals also create higher skilled jobs, reduce unemployment. So it has the capability to boost technological and industrial development. So that's what we are really pushing uh, very strongly, promoting uh, value addition on countries that uh, produce these uh, critical minerals. Now, for the just and uh, um, diversification and green transition in commodity dependent countries, uh, this will require strong political commitment and leadership, not only in these countries, but at the global level as well. Because these green industrial policies in most of these commodity dependent countries, they will require a strong political commitment. Um, they, we need in support of in the international community to limit uh, the spe speculation, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. To <clears throat> uh, um, excuse me, I think I just got out of voice. I'll finish very quickly. And so we need the uh, international community to, to combat tax evasion, to promote technology transfer. We have to have a stronger measures of trade and investment, like uh, when we stimulate uh, um, investments in infrastructure, R&D. We need to have support on energy transition uh, to mitigate this consequence of, of these stranded re resources that is very important as well because uh, it's very un unrealistic to expect the commodity-dependent developing countries to voluntarily uh, strand their, for example, fossil fuel resources without an alternative, uh, an alternative development path. Um, and that requires the support of international community. And, uh, uh, and also in the countries that are, um, um, 
it's, it's also critical to have the support of international community in terms of funding. So to implement these nationally determined contributions and, um, and uh, move towards diversification. So, well, I think that cover everything on the report in a summary. Um, just transition, just diversification and green transition in commodity dependent developing countries will require strong politi political commitment, as I mentioned. Uh, this, while these challenges are similar across countries, each country should find its own path and countries should leverage their potential for renewable energy source and use uh, them to, to move towards uh, a resilient path. I invite everyone also to access the report in ACTA, the website, uh, and that's the, the link to it, and uh, give uh, the floor back to you, Taro. Thank you, Clovis, for the excellent presentation of the report. Um, and now it's time for uh, the panel discussion. But before we start the panel discussion, I would like to introduce our panelists. And um, I need first to apologize because in the program I have right here, Sonia is not in the program, so we are working on it to 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 to, to uh, add uh, Sonia in the in the in the in the program that we have online. So first, I would like to introduce Harry. Harry is our colleague from UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe. He has uh, over 30 years of experience in uh, natural resources and material management. And he has also worked with the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Department of Atomic Energy in India. And currently, he is the technical advisor for the United Nations Framework Classification for Resources and the United Nation Resource Management System. He has led over uh, 50 international technical cooperation and co collaborative research projects in sustainable resource development in uh, more than 80 countries. And he has also authored more than 100 publications. And then we have Sonia, sorry again, um, Sonia is the lead uh, sustainability specialist at the International Thin Association, where she's supporting the world's largest thin producers and the global thin industry in demonstrating commitment to sustainability and achieving positive local development, including through effective stakeholder engagement. Sonia is also a legal professional specializing in global environment and climate change law. Um, before um, joining the ITA and the thin sector, uh, she advised private and non-profit organization on human rights and sustainability projects in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And then we have um, um, France, or France. Uh, she's the professor of applied min uh, mineralogy at uh, the Comberna School of Mines. Her research interests are focused on critical raw materials, specifically uh, rare earth elements and lithium, with a global perspective on geology, responsible sourcing, processing, and circular economy. She's also a member of the UNECE. United Nations Resource Management System subgroup of the expert group on resource management and non-executive director of the ETEC Smith uh, uh, ETEC Resources, which is exploring for uh, rare earth in Namibia. And one of the great achievements that I've, I've highlighted in, in the in Professor Wall's uh, Bio is that she has she's a recipient of the William Smith Medal of the Geological Society of London for a contribution to the applied and economic aspect of geology, and she was named as one of the 100 global inspirational women in mining in 2016. So congratulations again. And then last but not least, Simon Michaud. Simon is an associate professor at the geometallurgy at the Geological Survey of Finland. He has a degree in uh, a basic degree in Bachelor of Applied Science in Physics and Geology, 
and a PhD in mining engineering. Um, Simon has uh, a long experience, long and rich experience. His main focus is on uh, developing uh, mineral processing and geometallurgy. And his long-term objectives include transforming the circular economy into a more practical system for the industrial ecosystem to navigate the two challenges and the scarcity of technology minerals and the transition away from fossil fuel. So welcome all of you panelists. Um, I'm grateful to, uh, uh, to be the moderator of this great panel. And uh, since uh, our audience is a bit uh, hesitant to uh, uh, to react, I would start asking you a few questions. And then uh, I think uh, listening to your responses and the answers, they would be uh, able to to join us in the discussion. So first of all, um, I turn to Ari. Ari, I'm sure we have read the, the report. Uh, so uh, what are the main messages of this report that you see particularly relevant in the UNECE member states? Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Taro. Um, good afternoon. Good good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. Um, Thanks to uh, Clovis and all UNCTAD colleagues for inviting us also to be part of this uh, uh, dialogue and also allowing me to uh, speak out a few points which are relevant to uh, UNEC region. Uh, as Dario has mentioned, the UN UNEC region is one of the largest producers and consumers of commodities and has the largest trade flows. The commodity dependence is a two-way sword in our region, at the producing end as well as the consuming end. The Commodities Dev and Development Report 2023 of UNCTAD uh, examines the links between commodity dependence, uh, greenhouse emissions, and structural transformation in developing countries. The report offers some key messages and policy recommendations that I think are particularly relevant for the UNEC member states, especially the commodity dependent developing countries. I want to uh, structure it in a, such a way that it is more action oriented. Um, taking all the words um, that Clovis has summarized in his presentation. First of all, the report shows that uh, the commodity dependent countries have a lower emission and has uh, than more de diversified economies, but they are more vulnerable to the effect of climate change. So the commodity dependent developing countries must pursue what I call, uh, and the report calls, the structural transformation to reduce their reliance on commodities and increase their resilience uh, to environmental shocks. Structural transformation can be achieved through uh, host of things, and most important is uh, diversification, technological upgradation, and innovation in the commodity sector. The report uh, importantly argues on diversification that uh, should benefit the society more broadly, uh, that should align with education, uh, with skills, and soften the negative uh, effects of the transition. This implies that uh, the commodity dependent member states, uh, developing countries must adopt inclusive and participatory approaches to diversification, allowing all stakeholders, especially women, youth and indigenous people. Uh, the report uh, also says that uh, developing countries need to invest in human capital development, social protection and infrastructure to support creation of decent jobs and provision of public services. Uh, second aspect is uh, the universal access to clean energy, uh, which should be ensured to all using available sources, including renewables, fossil fuel, while minimizing emissions. That means that the 
developing countries needs to balance their energy needs with environmental commitments, adopt low carbon technologies and practices to improve energy efficiency and reduce carbon footprint. The developing countries need to co cooperate with other countries and region to share best practices, access financing and technology for clean energy. It is important to focus on energy efficiency to keep the total energy cost, as, cost really low. Um, third, but not least, is a, a just transition. Essential aspect is the job creation, uh, which should be prioritized to foster social inclusion and reduce poverty job. Job creation is a key, key priority in the UNEC region, as it can foster social inclusion, reduce poverty, especially in the context of green transition. According to OECD, the UNEC region faces a great uh, green divide. Uh, some regions and groups are more exposed to risk and less prepared to the opportunities of green transition. To bridge this divide, the UNEC region must invest in skills development and competencies to help workers adapt to changing labor markets and access quality jobs in the green economy. Skills development and competencies can also enhance innovation, uh, productivity and competitiveness in the region and support social dialogue and participation in the transition process. So therefore, um, I will say that the report offers uh, key messages and recommendation for developing countries to pursue structural transformation, universal access to low carbon energy and a just transition while reducing emissions. These messages and recommendation could actually serve as a basis uh, for a framework for collaborative action within the UN system and beyond, uh, involving various stakeholders and partners. The framework could promote a shift towards, a shift from a commodity-centric to a society-centric approach, focusing on how resource development and management benefits are distributed and shared among people, especially the marginalized and vulnerable group. This approach is uh, aligned with what we call decommoditization, uh, which seeks to liberate people and places from a dependency on commodity form uh, of need of satisfaction, especially concerning basic life necessity. The UNSC has developed uh, the two frameworks there you mentioned, UNFC and UNRMS, uh, to support sustainable resource management uh, consistent with this approach, as they emphasize circularity, value addition, and resource servitization. UNFC and UNRMS can be used as tool to help commodity-dependent developing countries to implement the recommendation of the report and achieve their developmental goals. So I will stop here and um, look for further uh, discussion on this matter. Thank you. Back to you, Taro. Thank you, Ari, for this extensive response. Um, before we move on, um, I see that there are a lot of participants, 64 of them, and I'm sure they have questions to ask. So better, uh, um, I'll let you know that uh, there is a Q&A box down there. If you have questions to ask, please drop your, um, your question to that box, and then I'll read out to the panelists so that they can, they can answer. Thank you very much. Now I move to uh, Mr. Simon Michaud. I've seen that based on your, the project in your institutions, one of them that I've, I've noticed the battery mineral potential surveys, um, and that's on the availability of critical raw materials. Uh, yes. Yeah. So what are, the, what are your perspective on the critical raw material in Europe? Because I understand you're working mainly on Europe. Right. Yes. So I am I am based in Finland. So in Europe, yes, but I'm also looking at everything all over the world. Uh, this is a global problem and it needs to be globally understood and globally responded to. The work I'm doing is, does show that a transformation in how we look at the commodities industry is in progress. And what is absolutely needed is some form of managing the commodities industry uh, in a way that actually has a world worth living in. So this report is timely, um, it is useful, uh, but a lot more work needs to be done. Right, so the future of uh, the future will need raw materials of all kinds. To phase out fossil fuels, we are looking at an enormous amount of raw materials. 
So regardless of what we do and how we do it, we will need raw materials of all kinds everywhere all at once very quickly. So minerals are the new oil, but which ones? Now, the work I looked at directly was the green transition in its current form. Fossil fuels are going, that's not a question. But the green transition as it's currently proposed, I believe will not work. We don't have the mining capacity to deliver the raw materials need needed, either in the short term or the long term. A fundamental problem that has not been solved, as far as I can tell, um, is the needed buffer to mitigate wind and solar power generation. Even at estimates of just six hours, which is what conventional thinking thinks, the mining industry will not be able to deliver the needed quantities of minerals uh, without a massive ex uh, expansion. And that expansion is impractical. So the sheer quantity of infrastructure needed to achieve the uh, green transition is enormous. So we need to go back to the drawing board. Now, we can make batteries out of something else other than lithium-ion chemistry, but all electrification systems will use copper, and most will need nickel and graphite. So we, we, we are... We, we have still have to look at this. The commodities industry has been misunderstood, and this is actually where the true value of this work really comes in. Current thinking perceives it, uh, the commodities industry, merely as a market phenomenon. The market price of metals will go up and down, and the economics will be forced to keep up, and that's all the discussion we need to, to, to look at. The human cost of that market is considered not an issue. What the market really is, is a series of finite non-renewable natural resources that have engineering bottlenecks in extraction. We think of such resources are infinite and will always be there, but the real limit is our ability to access those resources, and this was change. We must change how we not see not just raw materials, but energy, technology, and economics as well, and that suggests a different social contract to do all that. And that brings us neatly back to this report. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And now uh, I'll turn back to, I'll turn to Professor Wall or Francis. Uh, you have contributed to a great document that was pre presented uh, during the UNECD Resource Management Week uh, organized last year. Could you please tell us uh, about the, the critical metals and their importance in the energy transition, please? Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for the invitation to uh, speak today. And you were highlighting a report, Taro, there that we presented in the, um, to the UN ECE. And interestingly, it was about critical raw materials, not in a commodity dependent country, but actually we were talking about the UK. So uh, it's a, an important point. I really enjoyed reading the report. And there are a lot of things that chime, not only between national economies, but between the smaller units in regions all across Europe, for example, where there are regions that used to be commodity dependent, like where I'm sitting right now in Cornwall, right in the southwest of the UK. When the tin price crashed in the 1980s, 1990s, then the mines closed. And although there was some diversification, there was the Cambon School of Mines, now part of the University of Exeter. And there's always been a cluster of consultancy companies that survived to work all over the world. The big heavy engineering disappeared and the mines with the well-paid jobs for the ordinary, you know, the re real kind of people of Cornwall all disappeared. And I think that's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. So now that we have the critical minerals, which of course started off as very specialist things like rare earths or lithium needed in just small quantities to make all our tech work, uh, you know, this has now really expanded to the real understanding of minerals, I think, and the importance in the energy transition. And where I'm sitting in here in Cornwall in the UK, we have deposits of tungsten and tin that have been worked before, and lithium, the new kid on the block. And so what we've been doing is using the UN resource management system and its 12 principles for sustainable development from natural resources such as minerals to see how we get it right this next time and diversify in a way that speaks to those equalities you were talking about. So we have things for everybody, but we want to get mines and some novel extraction from geothermal fluids and things going now to provide good jobs for local people in Cornwall. 
and then we need to diversify, we need to bring in the value chain. So the things are just the same in a region in the UK as they are in a national context in many countries in the world. And we're talking about skills, upskilling, what are the right skills? How do we bring in that value chain and the circular economy thinking? And we started this Cornwall case study as part of a circular economy research uh, project. And now we've got some UK government funding to do two things. One is we've joined up with colleagues across the UK to make an international centre of excellence in sustainable resource management um, to work with the UNECE and really think about that value chain and the interrelationships and how we use our materials very carefully. So we try and meet those energy transition needs that Simon was talking about, which is, you know, a hugely challenging task to get those raw materials. And the second thing is we have um, a project, a small project funded again by the UK government, where we're taking those learnings from Cornwall and talking to colleagues in Zambia. And, to, you know, they have very similar things, a different challenging environment. But we're going in right on the ground with those colleagues and talking to the mines in the geological survey, different scales of mines and seeing how these principles apply. And so I welcome the report from UNCTAD, really useful things that apply exactly in Zambia and together with the UNRMS. We're doing that right now and hopefully we'll be reporting in Geneva in April at the UN Resource Management Week on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, now, Sonia, do you want to react to um, uh, any of these issues? Because I understand you're working on um, thin, but in the uh, responsible sourcing and processing. Do you want? Yes, thank you, Taro. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to join the discussion today. It's it's really important topics, um, ones that, of course, heavily involve the industry as well as the public sector and government agendas. So these are all the same questions that um, on the supply chain and industry side um, we have as well. So my specific focus is on tin. So tin is one of these vital minerals and metals that are needed to um, power the energy transition and also digitization. So tin um, is a component, um, a small one, but essential in applications like solar, wind turbines, electric vehicles, energy storage, um, 5G. So there's uh, quite a lot of so-called downstream applications that will be needed to um, lower carbon impact um, where the mineral comes in. So um, maybe just uh, I would agree that recognizing the role of minerals and then how to also recognize that minerals like tin can have both a positive, but also, of course, a negative impact on achieving the sustainable development goals. I think that's important. And also then, um, I think there are some really interesting opportunities where we can leverage voluntary or industry initiatives and, and, and projects and progress that are being made in uh, supporting responsible mineral sourcing and production and linking that then to um, uh, government agendas and, and engagement. So I think to really make progress, it does take a, um, multi-stakeholder and, and a global effort. Um, something else that I maybe just wanted to mention from the tin sector perspective is that in tin mining, we have uh, mining at different scales. So we have, of course, mechanized large scale mining, um, but also there is quite a sizable informal mining sector um, in all of the minerals. So artisanal and small scale mining, which is inherently um, lower energy intensive because it's more manual, um, semi-mechanized or less mechanized um, mining uh, technologies. But also this informal sector 
um, although it needs support in mitigating again negative impacts, can also present a um, positive opportunity for local um, economic development uh, that can link quite um, well into these ambitions. So um, I might pause there. I'll be happy to comment further on specific initiatives of the industry, but there's maybe a first reaction. Thank you, Sonia. Now, uh, our audience is uh, responding to everything, so something that's very really good. We want to participate um, a, a very active and uh, participation from our audience. And right here, there's a question um, on the Q&A box. And the question says, do you think no reciprocal trade preferences such as the GSP or duty-free quota-free schemes granted to developing countries and LDTs may play a role in inclusive diversification in critical mineral-rich developing countries. So the floor is to who wants to take it. Uh, Clovis, yes. Yeah, can. maybe I can start. I think that is a it's a it's a important question and indeed it can play a role when you have this kind of non-reciprocal trade preference it's like a country gives preference to to exports or imports uh, uh, coming from a particular country and uh, when we want to to promote uh, the diversification value addition on developing countries that are producers of these critical minerals for example uh, if another country it provides some trade preference uh, to these uh, developing countries that are endowed with these critical minerals to export value-added products, so to export, uh, so to give preference to to already value-added products that they, these countries may produce, that would facilitate this diversification process. So for sure, they can they can help. Thank you, Provis. Uh, Francis may also want to, to add to it. Yes, so, so I just answer quite shortly. I'm glad you uh, took that as an economist, Clovis, because I was thinking, <laughs> I wonder what it really means. But maybe I can just add a very practical point from my rare earth experience. And um, so, of course, China is way in the lead with rare earths. It dominates supply and the whole value chain. And so there's uh, there's this uh, desire to diversify, not to put China out of business by any means, uh, but to diversify supply. And that really hasn't got very far in the last 10 or 15 years, actually. And I think what is what I see there is it's going to be really important to join up between the producer countries and the countries that are using the rare earth materials, especially magnets, what people are after in, in uh, larger quantities. But that means that we've got to find that balance. So the producer countries, and I could take Namibia as an example, we've made a rare earth alliance Namibia there to try and bring together a couple of um, companies who have good rare earth deposits that we're trying to, to develop, to think about how can we get more of that processing sitting in Namibia. But you won't get anywhere in rare earths unless you have a vertical integration, I think, with your final markets. And so probably that will have then to link to maybe to Canada or to Europe. And you'll see these alliances between the European Commission and countries across the world, including uh, Namibia is one of those and some of the other countries, UK to various countries. And I think we'll see some very specific value chains. So that's slightly different to trade agreements, but maybe it needs something on the economic side as well, Clovis, to make those things work and then very interesting how we get that balance right. Thank you, Francis. Harry, you want to look? Yeah, before. Yeah, just to um, complement uh, what Clovis and Francis has said, uh, the non-reciprocal uh, uh, trade preferences can help reduce uh, tariff barriers, uh, enhance competitiveness in the export of critical minerals um, and re related products to major markets like US, um, EU, uh, et cetera. Uh, but essentially it can encourage development of value added activities uh, and downstream industries in the critical mineral sector, such as processing, refining, uh, manufacturing and recycling. 
and uh, this uh, arrangements also can support implementation of good uh, and sound environmental, social, and governance standards and practices in the critical mineral sector. And it can also help in fostering regional integration. But however, there are a few downsides of these uh, mechanisms. Uh, one is uh, erosion of the uh, margin of preference due to proliferation of this reciprocal um, free trade agreements and reduction of the most favored uh, nation tariffs, uh, et cetera. Uh, there is complexity and uncertainty due to the rules of origin, product coverage, uh, grad mechanisms for uh, graduation, eligibility criteria, and uh, so forth. Uh, potential trade uh, di diversion and distortion effect could be there, and, and the lack of complementary policies and measures um, such as infrastructure, innovation, and uh, education, social protection uh, could be there. Therefore, non-reciprocal trade preferences uh, can play a critical role in inclusive diversification, but they also need to be designed and implemented in a coherent, consistent, and transparent manner, as uh, Francis mentioned, uh, some of the experiences, and accompanied with supportive policies and actions, both at national and in international levels. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Thank you to all the, the speakers who responded to this, uh, this question. And uh, um, before we get a lot of questions in the Q and A box, um, I'd like to talk to um, Simon, please. Um, Simon, what are the key elements for transforming the circular economy into a practical system for the industrial <clears throat> uh, ecosystem, especially in the context of developing? critical minerals for green technology. You have the floor. Okay, so this is actually quite a complicated question because the circular economy, I see the circular economy as the best game in town. You know, uh, it, this is what we must do. But as is currently presented, it uh, does not have any fundamental energy terms. So it's thermodynamically imbalanced. It needs to evolve. So the circular economy uh, is a stepping stone to something else. But it's the only direction worth going in. So we absolutely need to do it. So the required infrastructure to phase out, uh, this has come from work I'm doing at the moment. I looked at uh, the tasks of phasing out fossil fuels, what's actually involved, but also if we were to um, make a circular economy where all waste was captured and recycled and reinserted into manufacture, what would that look like? So the required infrastructure to phase out fossil fuels like power generation transport is several orders of magnitude greater than the infrastructure needed to build the circular economy. One's about energy and transport. The other is about the flow of raw materials. They're not the same job. Both will require a fundamental redesign of society. So fundamental that current thinking doesn't quite understand where we're going with that. So the current plan uh, in, in, for example, the green transition faces many logistical, practical bottlenecks in implementation. Right, but it, and it needs to evolve. What I would suggest is we should turn to some unconventional technologies that are there and we can look at, and a lot of those bottlenecks will lift. We've got to look at commodities differently and then value them differently and then manage them differently. So my show, work has shown the lion's share of the effort, the energy consumed in phasing out fossil fuels is the what, what we do with um, replacing trucks, internal combustion trucks. Right, and, and and finding an alternative method for that. That's taking 80% of the energy. So that suggests we should look at uh, what trucks do for us, you know, fundamental at a fundamental level to society, and that's the movement of goods around our society. How do we do that? Uh, we should redesign society to work in some other way. We should simplify society to run it on a smaller number of of um, components. We should establish more localized manufacturing capabilities so we can manufacture our own goods. At the moment, manufacturers distributed unevenly across the planet. So we, we haven't even agreed upon what the plan should be. Uh, uh, and so there's this non-linear distribution of supply of raw materials and a non-linear distribution of turning those raw materials into useful objects. Uh, and so we haven't actually agreed on that yet. And that's actually going to change the architecture of how we approach it. So at all levels, we need to go back to the drawing board and redesign everything. 
and we've got to uh, look at new technology solutions, look at things again. There's a lot of technologies that we reject because of ideology, not because the technologies don't work. We used to use the metric of money or economic value, whether we should look at something or not. I believe that should change. Energy is the master resource, so if you start there, where we get our energy from and how do we use it, what system are we going to use? And at the moment, the thinking is wind and solar is going to be a primary energy uh, uh, system. I don't think that that would be strong enough to replace fossil fuels, and there's engineering problems in scale-up uh, with that. So, so wind and solar may well fail and have to be replaced to something else. I'm looking at three possible technology vectors for us to consider. They are deep, deep drill geothermal, uh, but we're still waiting on a breakthrough in drilling that we can drill down to 10 kilometers easily and quickly. So far, we haven't done that. The second one, this is the one I'd like to look at, liquid fuel fission using thorium as the fuel. I, uh, this is an evolution of the nuclear cycle that is so different to conventional nuclear, it is almost not nuclear. It doesn't have the same sets of problems. The third one is the burning and recycling of iron oxide powder. So we consider all options uh, in a systems-oriented paradigm. We have to use systems thinking. All problems and all solutions have to be put on the table at the same time with every stakeholder around that table to discuss what we should do. What raw materials do we need and where do we get them from is the fundamental question. And that is, I believe, what the circular economy should be designed to address. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And your answer um, arose a few reactions on uh, the Q&A um, box. Somebody asking, uh, what's the role of trade agreement in what you, you're talking about? The circular economy, technology, all those things. Is there so, any role for trade? Yes, there is. So the question is, what is the true size of the circular economy? Right, like what's what's the whole size of it and how do how do we do it? Also, every region does something different. We're never going to, for example, um, like, like when I'm looking at the, the region of Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean, and I say, say like, well, they're never going to be in a position where they can mine minerals, manufacture uh, um, metals, and produce their own computers and electric vehicles. They're never going to do that. They've got to actually trade with someone else to get to that. Right, so, so every region is going to have to trade with every other region. What I think will happen, though, is what we trade and how we trade and the language we use to do it. And what I mean by that, instead of using market price and economics, we will go, fall back on a number of other metrics to do that. So the nature of trade is absolutely vital and it's going to happen all over the world. But how that trade happens will be very different to what we're doing now. Thank you very much um, for that. There's another question. Uh, is there a current gap in developing countries between industrial policy and entrepreneurship and SMEs, SMEs policies? How can we better build this, uh, uh, bridge this gap to help countries create local capacities to both diversify inclusively and implement the energy transition? So, so uh, well, I, think, I, I could take that if you, react, if you want to react, go ahead, please. So what you could do, say to that is uh, the change that is coming is so fundamentally different to what we, what we do now uh, that, that will involve great change across the board. And you could argue that every nation state, whether they're developed or not, is facing an enormous challenge, right? And we all have to actually rebuild our systems. And so we're starting from scratch. There are many circumstances where an undeveloped country may well have the advantage to get things done quicker because what they're replacing doesn't exist yet. So it depends on how we see this. I, I would turn all that around and look at this differently. And then all of a sudden, certain regions may respond faster than others. So then it becomes uh, a transfer of information of how we achieve certain things. And that becomes valuable. Again, we're back to trade. Yes, I would like to compliment on, on this particular aspect, on this gap between the industrial policy and entrepreneurship and SMP policies. Actually, in, in uh, for a long time, uh, countries didn't really have uh, 
pursued strongly an industrial policy. Now it's, it's back uh, uh, possible to do that because we see that even developed economies that are very diversified, technologically advanced, like the US and the countries in Europe, they are um, going through industrial policies exactly to go into these new sectors because it's important to to nurture these infant industries. So uh, there is what, this one aspect. The other aspect is for a long time as well, the entrepreneurship and SME policies were very much um, promoting any SME or any entrepreneurship. While we know that uh, there is a role for, for the government to provide a direction and direction towards sustainability is an important direction in terms of uh, exchange, structural change. So there is an important role to give this direction. And then if you align industrial policy with SME and entrepreneurship policies, and giving this override direction of the government towards sustainability, then you can align those. Thank you, Clovis. Uh, yes, Sonia, you have the floor, please. Thank you. This point may be slightly to the side of the question in the chat, but I just wanted to acknowledge that in the mining sector, so there are differences between the different minerals or commodities, for example, some mineral sectors may mostly comprise larger mechanized mining. Um, but when we think about mining and the actors involved in, in mining minerals or producing minerals, um, refining, smelting, um, they're not uh, necessarily the large, always the large multinational well-resourced companies who of course do have a large share of the, of the of the production, but not all of it. So in the tin sector, um, there are actually a lot of smaller SMEs, um, smaller medium-sized companies. Um, so it is a challenge. And I think at the moment, what we're seeing as well is um, there's a huge demand, but there's also um, a rapidly expanding demand around the environmental, social and governance conditions under which these minerals are produced. And a lot of that is falling, a lot of that cost is falling on the so-called upstream supply chain, <clears throat> which would be the producers often in the um, developing countries or mineral rich countries. So, so what I would um, maybe suggest is I think it's really positive that there's more policy and regulation around the trade and the <clears throat> conditions under which minerals are traded and produced. Um, but they should take into account the realities and practicalities of implementing progress and improvements for companies, but also in the um, for governments, local governments. Um, we definitely have a funding gap, a capacity building gap, um, but also um, as a, another point is understanding how global supply chains work. So global supply chains, very complex. And I think um, we've implemented something called the TIN code, which is an, um, to drive ESG improvements and including smaller actors globally. And I think what we find is that it's really important that we also bring supply chains closer together. So we find a way for um, supply chains also to, to um, collaborate better so that we take some of the burden away um, from the mineral producing countries and share it. Yeah, thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much for this uh, great answer. Um, now I come back to Ari again. Um, I'd like to ask you something about technical cooperation in resource development. I know that uh, you guys are organizing very soon um, the UNEC Resource Management Week again. Uh, can you share some insight uh, from your international cooperation project that you have successfully integrated uh, sustainable resource development with economic diversification and energy transition in developing countries? Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Taro. Um, following uh, especially the line of conversation we are just having about MSME, uh, UNCTAD has led a multi-partnership uh, MSME uh, project um, uh, on circ circular economy, uh, how, how to leverage the, the, the 
cap capabilities of uh, MSME search, uh, MSMEs uh, in this, and uh, as provide and and produce some case studies and and guidelines to to uh, do that. Uh, but I will not go into that. Um, Clovis and your colleagues will be much better placed uh, to comment on that. What I would like to do is uh, talk a little bit on uh, how we are uh, implementing UN frameworks, uh, UN uh, FC and uh, UN resource management system in a, in a few sub-regions. Uh, let me start with the EU, which is developed um, region, but which has got deep connection with uh, the neighboring developing uh, sub-regions, uh, the Central Asia and Africa, for example. Um, the EU has come up with the Critical Raw Material Act uh, very recently, which is being enacted, which is not fully enacted now. And it ensures, it is to ensure secure and sustainable supply of critical raw materials for the EU economy and uh, strategic technologies. Uh, the uh, act um, specifies using uh, UNFC as a tool to monitor supply risk, uh, to look develop national programs, and to promote uh, recovery of CRM from uh, the waste materials. Uh, the EU will also use UNFC to integrate uh, CRM, including with the battery raw materials and support development of Net uh, Zero Industry Act. Uh, where it connects to the developing countries is that uh, the EU is also uh, having strategic partnership with uh, the Global South. And a few examples uh, that come into mind is Kazakhstan, Namibia, Uganda, at, uh, where they will have uh, deep trade agreements, which was also mentioned in the chat, to co cooperate on extraction, processing, and refining of CRMs. And the same standards of sustainability, transparency, human rights that apply uh, uh, will apply in the EU will also apply to all these uh, projects which are having, uh, whether they will be partnering. Another example is Central Asia, where UNAC has implemented the project to improve national capacities uh, in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and, and Turkmenistan, and uh, Uzbekistan to implement UNFC and UNRMS for energy and mineral resources. The projects involved uh, assessment reports, case studies, workshops, policy recommends, uh, recommendation, et cetera. And uh, uh, the outcome, what the next step uh, these countries are going to do is to establish an international center of excellence on sustainable resource management, ISSRM, which Francis has mentioned, will be established in the UK with focus on circular economy here, the focus will be on integrated resource management uh, in the in the region. And uh, uh, the third example I can uh, talk about is outside of the region, but with the region which we, the UNEC region collaborates um, so much is Africa. Uh, the African Union Commission has uh, developed a African minerals and energy resource classification and management system based on UNFC and UNRMS, and uh, that supports value addition, uh, circularity, and uh, which is aligned with the African mining vision, the Agenda 2063 of Africa, and the SDGs. Uh, the, Amer the, the African system also includes a Pan-African Resource Reporting Code, or PARC, uh, for reporting on um, sustainable resource management, economic di uh, di diversification, uh, value addition, and social in uh, inclusion. So in conclusion, we are encouraging um, having systems in place. Uh, like the systems like UNFC and UNRMS are permanent and, and, and persistent and provide an advantage rather than ad hoc in, uh, interventions uh, for sustainable development and structural transformation which we were discussing today. So UNEC actions are a result in a systematic, system-oriented, which uh, Simon has been uh, talking about, and long-term benefits for the member states and the global community. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Since you mentioned Simon, somebody on the, um, online would like also to talk to, uh, to, to Simon about the, um, the circular economy. Um, what does it lead to? What does the circular economy lead to? Right. 
that is actually a brilliant question because the circular economy in its current form um, is only part of the solution. I think the circular economy will lead to a new paradigm of how we manage resources in our society. And that in turn will lead to a new paradigm of how we design the things that need those resources. Right, so, so we are heading towards a new social contract to manage our commodities, our technology, but also everything associated with that. It's, it's a fundamentally different society that's coming. The word circular economy does not give that justice. I believe, say, 50 years in the, in the future, looking back to now, the word circular economy will seen as a construction phase to whatever the next thing is. What will we call it? Well, well, I don't know. And I also don't believe any one person has all the answers. So I certainly don't have all the answers. What I need to do is find a group of like-minded people and work on this. And over time, we would then put some signposts about what society would actually do going forward. We face some enormous challenges. And, and some of those challenges is, is cleaning up uh, a lot of the environmental pollution that's happened on a global scale, especially in the seas, has happened at an industrial scale. So that will require an industrial solution, scale, a scale of solution. That has to be embedded in what we are doing. So the circular economy is one job of many in front of us. And you could say the circular economy is the platform we will set all other tasks on. Um, where it's going... I, I would probably sort of boil it down to say a new era of human civilization that will happen all over the world all at the same time, but how it's applied will be different in every region. Thank you very much for the answer. And that's a great program, right? Reason to get out of bed. <laughs> uh, Francis, you want to react? Oh, well, I was just going to, <laughs> that was a very visionary, Simon. I would say our research, uh, we have a research centre in the UK, acronym is Met for Tech, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, and we're, we're trying to write a roadmap right now for, for what we do. And I think the circular economy, we're saying we're bringing in these new critical raw materials in in to the economy and what we need is a, a careful economy so that's the first thing about a circular economy how are we really going to look after these things and i think it's a sharing economy as well isn't it simon so we need we talk about resources a service that's harry's favorite theme mm -hmm. isn't it how are we really going to use things much more efficiently and effectively so that although we'll need to mine and there's certainly opportunities for countries that you know, want to get good economic and sustainable development out of that, we will need more materials <clears throat> we need to mitigate by slowing down the flow of materials, being much clever on the inbound, all the way from geological exploration to manufacturing, to make sure that the goods that we make will last a long time and are very easy to take around the high value loops of repairing and remanufacturing. And then we need to get much clever at recycling them at the end. So yeah, lots to do in the circular economy. It's a big topic and lots of practical steps we can take now as well as moving towards the, the bigger vision that Simon just outlined. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, now we are coming close to the end of uh, our webinar. Um, I would like to see um, who between the, the speakers, I don't know who somebody has something very burning to, to say, something that he or she has forgotten to say so far. No reaction? Very, very quickly say, so we're here obviously joint with the UNECE and the new resource management system, as Harry has described. I think, you know, we are keen from those of us who started using it, we're very happy to share our experience. So if there's anybody looking to try the UN resource management system, if you just contact Harry, he'll, he'll put you in contact with one of us who can talk to you about our experiences. We're very keen to share and help. So. Thank you very much, thank you. So, so Tara, I, I would say that, um... It's very clear to me, at least, that either we work together in some formalized fashion on the things that matter, or we go to war with each other. 
right? That, that those are that's literally our choices in front of us, right? So we either work together or or we 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 roll out the worst humanity has to offer. So the kind of change that I'm suggesting now is society at large changes into the following form: what we want, what we need, and what we do all come into alignment. And that is not the case where we are now. So that's a, that's quite a fundamental change when you actually ripple it through the industrial ecosystem. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Before I close, maybe Nicholas, you have something to say? Um, ah, right, yeah, um, just um, uh, reiterating what Simon has said. Uh, we had some bad experiences in the past uh, centuries, uh, fight over resources. We were at each other's throat um, for a long time in different regions. Now this conflict is not going away. It is still there. We have conflicts in our region, UNEC region. In Ukraine, we have conflict in, in the Middle East, uh, which has been going on for a long time. With uh, the economy shifting to minerals, um, then uh, this uh, this conflict is going to widen. And uh, this, unless we redesign the whole thing in a different way, uh, shift away from commodity dependence into diversifying the economy, which is really low carbon, which is really circular, and which leads into something which is uh, seeing the resources as a public good, not as something which is uh, some for immediate economic gains. Uh, this long-term thinking, which is enshrined in our uh, SDGs, which has been enshrined in our common ag uh, agenda, uh, the, the first uh, um, borderline but, report and all, uh, we have to relook and redesign a new system uh, accordingly. That is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yes. You. Yes, so uh, with it, that's uh, these are uh, the very best uh, final words that Hari gave to us. I just have uh, the words of thank you to Hari and uh, colleagues uh, in e UNECE, uh, to to Dario. Uh, we our uh, big thanks and to our panelists uh, that are with us today, Francis, Sonia, Simon. Thank you very much and the colleagues that have joined the participation. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to discuss the report with you, see how the perspective of UNAC countries are uh, related to the message of the report. And we look forward to continue this conversation with you all in the initiatives and projects and uh, uh, in the future. Thank you very much, colleagues. Yeah, thank you, Clovis. Thank, thank you, everybody. I've been very happy to moderate uh, this very balanced panel. So looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you again and bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Bye guys.